Greetings shippers, welcome back. Now if you've been in multiple fandoms for a while, or even just one or two, you may have noticed that on average, there doesn't seem to be as much FF work being done, be it fix, art, or just general discussion, works depicting what is often called femslash are often in short supply. Which for either the observer of fandom, but particularly for the fan of or shipper of such works, can range from saddening to problematic. So let us go on a journey and try to unravel just where is all the femslash fiction, and why does there seem to be so little produced? This video was voted for by the lovely folks over on Patreon, and it was one of many fandom-themed questions. So head on over there if you're interested in helping to determine content or curious as to what's coming up next. Thanks to all those supporting in that way, and now let's dive in. Fandom is a subculture that is not only difficult to remember is a subculture when one is so deeply involved in it, but is also one that is often defined with fallacies by those who are outside it. Some of the most common being, it's inhabited solely by straight white fangirls, that it contains only females, and that all fiction is written by either sexually naive teens or sexually frustrated housewives. Suffice it to say, none of these are accurate, though some of them do hold tiny kernels of truth and are based in fandom's history. An example being, fandom does owe a lot to the housewife, who back in the day often had time to write contributions for zines while their children were at school. However, they were not the only people contributing. The point being, sometimes these preconceived notions can become the stereotypical lens through which all fandom is viewed, and through which people attempt to answer such questions, such as where are the FF works, alas, often by assigning blame. So what did these stereotypes have to do with this question? Well, there is one fandom stereotype that is 100% true, and that is that most of the fiction is male male. Now while there are exceptions, fandoms that buck the trend, the vast majority of fandoms are dominated by these ships, at times almost to the exclusion of all others. When others are present, based on statistics that have begun to be gathered by massive fanfiction archives such as an archive of our own, the next most commonly sexually depicted is heterosexual and then the aforementioned FF. Now why there is so much slash fiction is a bit of a different topic, but definitely ties into why there is so little lesbian slash bisexual fiction. As we have talked about before, while fandom and fanfiction has existed for a long time, the genesis of the format most people currently recognize and the beginnings of systems of sharing, zines, cons, and the like, really took off in the 60s in the Star Trek fandom. While Kirk and Spock were not the first pairing of that era, sharing the stage with several others, they were certainly the most popular, and the spread of their zines came to define what a lot of people viewed fandom as slash for. That being a place to explore unexamined chemistry between characters, oftentimes deemed taboo, which homosexuality in the 60s and 70s certainly was, and still is today in some circles. While fanfiction and fandom also served other purposes, i.e. gen fiction and het pairings, and of course FF, this aforementioned facet seemed to dominate. To the point where slash, which once was a term that also encompassed gen fiction, came to almost exclusively define male-male pairings. As can be evidenced by the fact that when slash is applied to FF pairings, it is not called slash, but fem slash. However, if for many people this side of fandom became a place to explore ignored chemistry and taboo relationships, then why was there not more in terms of queer female representation? Well, it is here that many of the assumptions regarding fandom come into play, and are often hoisted up as the cause of this gap. Now, while fandom has begun to take stock of the type of fix produced, information on who is producing these fix is still a little scarce. That is not to say it is not collected, but in general there is less interest in who is producing the fiction versus what is being produced and where. Also, these surveys for author stats rely on people filling them out slash being honest when they sign up for a site slash service. And if it is voluntary, there are certain people who answer such queries and some who never bother. So it is easy to make assumptions about authors, be it about gender, ethnicity, sexuality, and of course motivation. One of the common common reasons given for the lack of FF is the heterosexual fangirls are only interested in fetishizing men for their own purposes, to gawk at them instead of exploring female chemistry or even properly defining these aforementioned male-male relationships. Now while there is a disproportionate amount of male slash fiction out there, and there is some fetishization at play for certain creators, that is not the reality for most. For most shippers, their ships run much deeper than the thrill of seeing two men kiss. Even if that may be part of the enjoyment for many, it is more a facet of seeing these two characters they view as complementary come together. Now whether or not that translates into proper or realistic depictions is another story. So it's not to say that this doesn't happen, but fandom is too varied for that to be the sole factor. Another reason often cited is fans being unable to view a work outside of a heteronormative lens, which can definitely be the case when you hear people claim that there is absolutely no chemistry at all, and then describe a scenario that would end with two heterosexual characters probably married by the series end. However, if some are missing these cues, how 
how is it that there is still so much male slash fiction? At this point, some note that it does appear that there are many heterosexual women and queer men producing fiction. Perhaps these pairings are more to their taste. However, while the presence of these authors should not be understated, it can at times be overstated. With all these musings, it's easy to understand why so many fem slash fans are frustrated. At times it appears that they are their own subset within a subset. And as a result, it is clear why some begin to believe that factors such as lesbian erasure and female censorship are running rampant. However, there are more factors at play that coalesce into a cascade of circumstances that may just answer the question. When it comes to shipping, while there are those who can and will gladly ship characters who have never met, the vast majority are drawn to characters they've seen interact and share the same universe. Indeed, there is often confusion and pushback when these two criteria are not met, which already puts queer female fiction at a disadvantage, as there are very few female-led projects out there, wherein the lead characters are female or where the female contingent of the cast make up the majority or even even half of the ensemble. Even when these criteria are met, i.e. there are female characters present, it is not uncommon for them not to interact, or for them to be underdeveloped, so people don't always gravitate to them as much as other characters. Oftentimes in these situations, another ship rises to prominence, and the female characters can either be written in his romantic interests, which does not always go over well in fandom, or end up being reduced to props used to create pathos, as is often the ultimate fate of any side character, regardless of age or gender. However, this facet is slowly beginning to change. There are more and more shows featuring predominantly or at least equal female male casts, and the better these projects do, the more will hopefully be produced, as the entertainment industry is nothing if not a business. As this increase has occurred, there has been a rise in fem slash pairings, with the likes of Swan Queen, Supercorp, Cardinelli, Rizzoli and Isles, Clexa, and the list goes on. So with more representation, there seems to be an increase in mainstream shipping, as those who require interaction and enjoy playing off established fandom tropes, i.e. rivals to lovers, best friends to lovers, boss and employee, and more now have what they require to jumpstart a ship. However, these ships are still the exception, and there are many who are unhappy with their fates not only in canon but in fandom, as they feel that many fans miss crucial cues that are not missed in other pairings. There is perhaps a reason for that. Let us examine the representation of the female friendship. Now, friendships between males and females have very different cultural expectations and depictions. However, there are some common threads that run throughout, namely that the female friendship is meant to be both extremely close yet deadly. Like female sexuality, the portrayal and expectation of female friendship is often dichotomous, from cunning manipulative she-devils who cannot be trusted, to friends, closer than siblings who regularly engage in activities that in general in other types of relationships would be considered potentially couple behaviors. Now the extremely manipulative cannot be trusted depiction does not naturally lend itself to shipping, because in these cases the relationships depicted are often cruel, featuring underhanded deeds that no one could recover from. These characters are more than rivals and often treat each other more cruelly than enemies, so it can be harder for people to get behind this kind of ship. Now for the more positive depictions of friendship. Here, a quick pause to note that there is of course nothing wrong with appreciating a good friendship and not shipping, or seeing the appeal of Jen. However, some of these behaviors may be of note for those who are generally shipping inclined. Clothes sharing, hand holding, and bed sharing are all activities associated both with romantic relationships, but also platonic female friendship. So if one is watching a show, for example, and these behaviors occur, one is potentially more likely to ignore it or not fully register the romantic potential. This is not malicious, merely a result of certain socializations. However, this too has begun to change as people have become more aware of queer relationships and voices and have come to appreciate there are other ways to read certain scenes than the norm. This is of course aided by the increase in queer media both mainstream and indie. In short, the landscape of fandom is always changing as different people enter, and the more socially aware people are as they enter, the greater variety of fiction they produce. There is a lot to be said for Femslash. It is often a great space to hear a vast number of stories told about characters who don't often get a fair shake in the actual canon for reasons already mentioned. It can be a haven for exploring the unexplored character as well as unrealized romantic potential. If one takes a moment to examine these factors, it is possible that a fem ship may suddenly come upon them where they never saw one before. At the same time, if one does not, that does not mean the shipper is necessarily inherently homophobic or close minded, so long as they still acknowledge the validity of these other pairings, even if they do not themselves ship them. Too often statements such as Swan Queen does not exist, or there was no subtext in Xena, make the rounds. Just because one does not understand something, or it is not canon, does not mean it does not exist. 
Again, it is easy to see why so many femme slash shippers feel marginalized. Being in the smallest ship of any fandom can be frustrating depending upon how the majority utilizes their status, and for that to occur pretty consistently can make one begin to feel a bit sidelined, and potentially angry. As a result, Fem Slash has a history of creating its own spaces within shipping culture to be heard, its own fandom awards, its own zines, etc. While Fem Slash may seem to have a separate history, it does run parallel to the rest of fandom, as it is of course part of it and not separate from it. However, its burst does come later, for FF awareness skyrockets with Xena Warrior Princess. It is also unique in that there is more of a debate amongst Fem Slash shippers as to why there is so little, and the fans tend to be very loyal and even move from fandom to fandom together. So the communities can become quite closely knit, and it can be difficult for some to break in, and that can make it a bit intimidating. On the flip side, it can of course be very welcoming. And then there is of course Yuri, but when not used colloquially, that refers to an actual canon genre, not just a fandom one. A great example of this is the very vibrant Disney femme slash community that creates alternate queer headcanons for the princesses. So while it may not be the majority, there is more of it than you may think but it may take some looking. And it of course must be noted, just because there is less in number does not make it less valid in stature. The notion that not only are there only female fans, but only straight ones in fandom must also truly be challenged, as many queer women and men, both straight and queer as well, feel themselves erased from conversations about fandom, which does not allow one to gain a true appreciation for how varied and diverse fandom truly is. Now, of course, when fans feel marginalized, they can lash out and accuse others of trying to silence them or mock their lifestyle or even disavow them, but it's always important to also try and keep oneself in check. Going after people online in a harassing manner is not productive and can divide fandom even further, steering others further into their own little fandom pockets and stifling conversation. People of certain orientations or backgrounds will not always produce the works one expects of them or operate under the rationale one expects either. As always, be kind to one another, ship and let ship, and open your mind, you'll never know what awesome ships you could encounter. Now one must briefly tackle canon. These relationships are rarely depicted canonically, and when they are, if they are the focus, they often don't last long. In fact, nuanced lesbian or female bisexual relationships are the exception rather than the rule, which can add to shippers' frustration, as those who look to canon for their shipping blueprints are often furnished with underwritten or quickly fridged slash shelved examples. However, it again must be noted, this is shifting, though not as rapidly as many people would like. And there are, of course, fetishistic and token portrayals. And as a result of poor portrayals, sometimes these relationships aren't taken as seriously, a trend that is hopefully one of many that is fading out. Fans often campaign for better canon representation, but relations between fans and production staff are often fraught and unfortunately rarely yield results that satisfy fans, and can often leave both sides with poor reputations, which for FF still leaves fandom as a bastion for more nuanced fair depictions, which can be another reason fans are so passionate about them and so frustrated when people dismiss what representation even in fandom can mean to people. As with most issues, all of the facets are subtle and worthy of examination, and one should often take a step back and examine what one is about to do before one does it, just to make sure things don't go too far, which is as always, easier said than done. And of course, when it comes to this, some people simply don't worry about such things when it comes to fandom. They ship what they ship, and that is the end of it. Any surrounding discourse is not bothered with. So where is the FF? It's there, but it can be difficult to find because of a lack of representation or an unwillingness slash lack of familiarity with alternate forms of coding. However, as mentioned, things change. Who knows what fandom will look like in a year's time, yet alone 10. So keep on shipping, writing, and sharing those glorious fem slash ships. And if you've ever had an inkling, go with it. Follow it down the rabbit hole, see where you end up, or what you end up creating. The world can always use more fandom. Broadening one's horizons in general is always a good thing. So what if the characters never met? So what if they're not in the same universe? So what if the creative staff hates them? If it's fascinating to you, dive in. Here, I'll help. Sif slash Valkyrie, go. Share all of your favorite FF ships down below and let me know which one you'd like me to cover in the future. The ones with the most suggestions will go into a fem slash only vote over on Patreon. This has been Shippers Guides to the Galaxy. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Follow me on social media to stay up to date. Special thanks to all my lovely patrons names on the side. And as always, stay tuned for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.